grades and no pressure, right? <laughs> Fortunately, Mary, Mary already dropped the F-bomb, so I won't have to be the first one to do it. That's good. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm super happy to be here. As I said, I'm Camille Fournier. I'm the CTO at Rent the Runway. And this is a talk about how to become a multiplier, because cloning yourself isn't an option. That being said, let's just do a thought exercise very quickly where you imagine what you might do if you could, in fact, clone yourself. Uh, so some things that come to my mind, at least, if I could clone myself, I might learn a new programming language. Maybe I'd learn, like, really how to use Docker. I kind of have this vague idea. I don't really understand it that well, to be quite honest. Uh, I might work on a side project. Maybe I'd have my clone do my laundry for me. I can, I can think of a lot of things that I might do with a clone. OK, so if you had a clone who could only exist in the course of your workday, right, who could only help you get more done at work, that's it, what would you do then? So you might use that clone to get another feature out the door. Maybe you would use the clone to improve the performance of some part of your code or write a run book, right? You can think of some tasks. You've got a to-do list. You've probably got a lot of tasks on that to-do list that you might use your clone to help you with. <sighs> Technical skills and getting more done. These are the areas that we often focus on when we think about how to improve ourselves. I do it. I, in fact, wrote this talk. Uh, really, I wrote this talk based on a blog post that I wrote after doing a whole bunch of reviews for my senior staff on my team at Rent the Runway. And a lot of the people in their reviews, when they wrote about what their goals were or their areas that they wanted to improve, they wrote things like, oh, I really want to like, spend more time coding. I want to get better at this particular skill. I want to learn how to do iOS development. Nothing wrong with any of that, right? I do it as well. But when you think about it, even if you could clone yourself, right? even if you could actually have another person, you're really only getting maybe twice as much done in that time. And I don't know about you, but when I think of a multiplier, I don't think of that sort of linear improvement, right? I might think of like a 10x engineer, maybe even more, right? If you think of it, forgive my like really ridiculous fake math here, but if you think about it, right, you know, let's say you get twice as much better, you have a clone that's helping you get twice as much done, then for every, you know, unit of input you put in, you get twice as much impact out of it. But when I think of a multiplier, I don't think of like an O of N algorithm, right? I think of like maybe an N squared. So if we zoom out and compare these two, right, what you see is that you've got, you know, sort of two functions that start out very close, and then the multiplier function pulls away really, really quickly from the sort of additive. OK, so silly math doesn't really mean anything. But where am I going with this? If you want to be a multiplier, probably what you're going to need to do is not just more of what you do right now, or not just what you do right now a little better. It's probably going to actually require a different function, different abilities, different skills, different focuses. Fortunately, I believe that everybody in this room possesses those skills uh, because you have basic virtues that have led you to become where you are today as lead developers. But before I go into what I think you should think about focusing on, let's talk a little bit about technical skills really quick because, of course, technical skills are foundational. So you're all here because you are lead developers, which hopefully means all of you have spent quite a while working on your technical skills, and you're very, very good. That's good because one of the biggest pieces of advice I give to people who want to go into management or leadership is not to neglect technical skills. Because really, I think the sort of pyramid of success looks like a foundation of strong technical skills, add in some other stuff, and top it off with don't be a jerk. It's really important. Don't be a jerk. I'm still working on that. But, but you know, you, it's, it's a very important thing, right? Uh, you want to build on a strong foundation of technical skills, and you should always be thinking about learning, right? That being said, here's what starts to happen to us, right? You spend, you know, some years in school and many years where your main focus of your job is writing code, and you start to suffer from availability bias, right? We all have cognitive biases, many cognitive biases. This is just one of them. Uh, availability bias has a bunch of different sort of uh, tr definitions, translations, right? One of which is that you tend to value things that you're good at, right? If you are good at programming, 
you probably think programming is really valuable. If you're not good at writing, you may not think writing is as valuable as programming, right? In reality, all of these skills have value. Uh, all of the skills that, you, that are in an organization, right? Marketing has value, sales has value, programming has value. All of these skills have value, but we tend to value the things that we're really good at. And, you know, frankly, we may overvalue them. We also tend to go to them very quickly. That's the first thing at the top of our minds. So when we think about what areas for growth do I have next year when I'm writing my self-review for my boss, right? We often think about the easy things to think about, the things that we already know how to do. Learning new technical skills, right? It's just, it's just a go-to. We always know there's more to learn, and we value it a lot, so we think about it very quickly. Now, one other element of availability bias is that you tend to overemphasize sort of lurid consequences, right? So people are more afraid of sharks and shark attacks than they are of drowning. Maybe not all people, but many people, right? When in reality, you're like more likely to get killed by lightning than a shark, I think. It's just very, very, very rare. And you're way more likely to drown than you are to be attacked by a shark. So what is the shark attack version of you know, availability bias for engineers, well, it is the dire consequences of not being technical enough. Oh my God, you're gonna turn into a pointy-haired boss and nobody's gonna listen to you and you're just gonna be that, that, you know, that idiot from you know, whatever, like the IT crowd, right? You know, like, oh my gosh, this person just doesn't know anything about technology at all. Why is that person my manager? They are not qualified to be in this job. So there is a huge amount of fear maybe over-justified, to be quite honest. I don't know that you're really in that much danger of losing your touch completely if you don't focus entirely on your technical skills, right? But we're all very afraid of it. So, all that being said, right, probably if you really were to take a step back and think about, for professional reasons, what are my bottlenecks over time? What are the things that are you know, affecting and impacting my ability to get stuff done and get the right stuff done at work. When you first start out, you're learning how to do the job. You are learning how to write code, you're learning how to be in a professional setting, right? All of those elements, those skill-based elements of being a developer. But probably everyone in this room has been doing it for a while now, right? And you probably, you know, can kind of recognize that over time, the skills, the actual technical skills are not the thing that is your bottleneck anymore, right? Your bottleneck is probably things like hours in the day or your ability to focus on any one thing, right? Every time you have to switch your focus onto another thing, you lose a little time and energy. So focusing just on optimizing the technical skills part of your bottleneck is unlikely to produce the same kinds of results it produced early in your career. Okay, so you can and should continue to learn new skills. And you know, if you decide that you want to ignore all the advice that I have in this talk, that's totally fine. Um, I think there is a very enjoyable career for folks who just really want to spend all of their time focused on the technical and learning new things and becoming sort of gradually wiser due to that accumulated uh, impact of all of that learning. But I think if you really want to get to the next level, if you really want to be a leader and a multiplier and a person who just generates a ton of value in the organization around you, you're probably going to need to do something more than just improve your technical skills. So what do you do? Fortunately, we all possess a series of virtues that enable us to be great developers, right? You're all lead developers. We all have three virtues, right? What are those virtues? They're laziness, impatience, and hubris, right? Uh, if you have not read this little bit from uh, Programming Pearl by Larry Wall, I highly recommend it. This is one of my favorite ways of thinking about programming, because I actually really agree with him here. I think he's, I think he's really on to something. But talking about these things that you don't traditionally think of as virtues, but when channeled in the right way, make you much more effective as an engineer. And I believe that you can also channel these in the right way to make yourself more effective as a leader. So how do we do that? Let's start with laziness. What does laziness mean as an engineer? Laziness means that you automate things 
that you might do manually, right? I mean, if you think about Perl, if you think about writing code in Perl, what is Perl? But I really do not want to type these shell commands in over and over and over again. I'm going to write a script to automate it. Very, you know, that's, that's where Perl pro programmers are, you know, really, really very, very strong, right? So what does laziness look like in a leadership context? Laziness looks like training your replacement. Okay, this is something hopefully everyone in this audience has heard before. But I'm gonna tell it to you again, and I'm gonna go into some detail about why this is valuable. So, you know, laziness as an engineer, right? Automating things that you would do manually so that you can more easily, you know, do them in the future, right? It requires a little bit of upfront work. Training your replacement also requires a little bit of upfront work. But it is the closest thing out there to cloning yourself. Right? If you really do think that a huge part of your abilities to get more done and to be, have more impact at your job are that you just simply cannot get enough done, probably you need other people that know how to do what you do to help you. When you are the bottleneck in any kind of process on your team, that just slows your team down. And that means that you are always the person stuck doing a particular task. Right. Uh, we've all learned, hopefully, as leaders, and certainly, if you haven't, you will at some point, you don't want one person who knows how to fix a certain problem because that problem will happen while that person is on vacation at some point. Or even worse, that person will quit, and now you're in deep trouble, right? So having these single points of failure in our organization is not a good thing, and as leaders, Part of our job is making sure that we are never that single point of failure, right? Training everyone around us to do those things that we're really good at. Now, this is a scary thing to do. I'm not gonna lie, right? If you train people around you to do what you're good at, they might be better at it than you are. <laughs> and that's scary, right? There, there is this, you know, I, I don't know about all of you, but I certainly occasionally am afraid of this idea of like, I'm gonna train someone who's just younger and smarter and harder working and better than me and I, they will eclipse me and I will, you know, I will be done, right? I'll, I, I won't be the special person anymore, right? Giving up that special power, giving up those special things that only we know how to do is a scary thing to do. But if you ever want to grow, if you ever want to move on, if you ever want to do new things in your company, go to new jobs, you have to train people around you to do what you do. I mean, you don't have to. You can just quit and go somewhere else, but that's not a great leadership technique, right? If you really want to be a great leader, you want to make your whole organization as effective as you are. So be lazy, train your replacements. Okay, virtue number two, impatience. An impatient engineer writes code that anticipates future needs, right? You don't just write for loops that are like one to four. You write for loops that are like however long this, this list or collection, however large this collection is, I'm gonna operate over it. That's a very trivial, silly example, but you are impatient not to have to change things every single time the tiniest change happens, right? Impatience in leadership, I would argue personally, is the most important thing, if you take one thing away from this talk at all, even if you think everything else I say is bullshit, listen to this part of the talk, because I think this is actually the most important skill. It's very hard to teach. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to teach it to you well today, but I hope I will at least help you think about it. An impatient leader, an impatient multiplier, prioritizes, understands what's important, knows when to say this work is not important and we should not be spending our time on it right now. They have a sense for what is valuable to do and they focus themselves and everyone on their team on what is the most valuable work to do. Uh, when I was originally writing this talk, I did a lot of like reading of blog posts about the 10X engineer, right? Most people think that that person either doesn't exist, or if they exist, it's really a product of a very functional workplace, right? Where everybody is just a lot more productive, and you know, really productive people are really, really productive. But people that do think that maybe these 10X engineers sometimes exist, one theory was that, well, these people are actually just really good at identifying the right problems to work on. Those problems that, you know, when they solve this problem, all these dominoes fall 
pa past that, right? And all of a sudden, all these other things can be done, right? The developers on the rest of the team are so much more productive. The business just makes that much more money because this was a linchpin feature or project, right? The Tanx engineer has a good sense of what is valuable to do. So I saw this series of tweets, and I, you know, I want to be careful. I think this person was meaning this to be not entirely complimentary, right? How to succeed in tech? I added the question mark. You know, volunteer for hard problems. Write down the first thing that comes to mind. Ship it. Hand off the project. Take on several similarly challenging problems. When bugs happen, they're the responsibility of the team that you handed the project off to. Ship again. Insist on a culture of we did the best with what we had at the time, right? Shut down criticisms of yourself by pointing to that culture. And then get a promotion where you don't have to do anything. So I, I think this is you know, funny, and I totally understand why this resonates. But this person is succeeding. The person who does this, who identifies volunteers for challenging problems and ships them over and over and over again, that person is really valuable. Right? That person has a sense for what is important to do. Instead of looking at this and thinking, oh god, like I never want to work with that person because then I'm supporting all their crappy code. Well, look, every, code that, every, every bit of code that was written six months ago by yourself or not by you is probably kind of crappy. Right? Like we, just, we, all, we know that code always is not very good. It always has bugs. It's never perfect. But especially in a startup environment, right? Uh, which is what I have been in for the last four years and what I think about a lot, shipping something that proves its value enough that it's actually worth supporting over time, that is a sign of someone who really understands what's important and who really understands that the important thing is getting the code out the door, right? That the first, that proving that somebody wants that code now, over time, there are more important things than just getting the code out the door. I'm not going to say that that's the most important thing forever and ever and always, but leaning into the sense of value, of what creates commercial value, what creates value for your business, what creates value for your team, and being impatient to work on those problems is a really important part of becoming a multiplier. You should focus yourself on trying to learn how to prioritize and identify these areas of value in your team. Uh, you know, when I, when I was thinking about this uh, talk again recently, uh, what I was, I've been thinking a lot about what process means to engineering, right? So, you know, I'm a CTO, whatever that means. I have a personal definition of CTO, but not everybody agrees on that, right? There's the VP of engineering, what does that mean, right? There's you know, directors of engineering, what do all these like, different titles really actually mean? They mean different things in different companies. But a lot of what people focus on when they think of technical leadership, particularly non-technical people, they often focus on this idea of like process, right? Oh, if you just have the process, you can tell me the engineering velocity, and therefore I will know that the team is getting work done or not getting work done. And so you know, the, they are looking for people who are really good at implementing processes and you know, rolling those processes out across large engineering teams. And that's how efficiency is created, theoretically. Now, I've been thinking about that a lot because I'm not personally actually all that good at that. I, I value it, but I'm not actually very good at implementing process. And as I thought about this, I realized that you know, process is important especially as you get to be having a large, complex organization. Process is what gives you clarity and context for what's going on. You can look very quickly and see, oh yes, this team's working on this, and this one's working on that, great. But process does not actually imply decision making, right? Process may tell you points in which decisions need to be made, but process cannot make the decisions for you. If it could, we could literally automate that away, right? If you can codify it to such an extent that the process itself can lead to the decision, why do you need humans involved, right? Leadership and that multiplier element is identifying when those decision points come up, identifying where the value is and trying to push the team into the direction of what is important. And in particular, also saying, don't do this. Let's not work on this stuff. Yes, this stuff is annoying us. Oh my god, this, this thing about the code, I get it. You really want to refactor it. But right now is not the time. Maybe in two months when we ship this project, that will be the right time. And I know, I know, what I'm saying is a little bit heretical to you know, the really, really serious 
engineers. I get it. I, I'm actually, look, I'm actually very much a person who really appreciates beautiful, clean code, well-tested, you know, good engineering structure. But there is a time and a place for everything, and sometimes the most important thing to do is not the perfect thing, but the thing that is going to create the most value right now. So being impatient for creating the thing that has the most value, and when, whatever decision-making level you are at, right, making all your decisions, keeping in mind where the value lies, working on that skill of impatience is a huge important part of becoming a multiplier in your organization. All right, the last one, hubris, excessive pride. An engineer who is excessively prideful is proud of their code, right? They want to show it off to the world. They want to write code that they're proud of that others can look at. So what does this mean as a leader or a multiplier? This means that when you, you trust your sense of what's good and what isn't, and when things aren't good, you have pride in your, in your sense that like, you know what, things, this isn't good, I'm not happy. The people around me are not happy. This isn't going very well. I'm going to not only complain about it, I'm also going to make a suggestion for how to fix it and help see that solution through. So probably at least some of you in this room have had the experience of having a developer or two or many on your team that will complain about many, many things. They'll complain about the build is too slow. They'll complain about, I don't like you know, the beer on Fridays. I'll complain about whatever, right? I don't like Jenkins. I want to use Travis CI or, you know, I don't like Docker. I want to use Vagrant. You know, there's just like, there's, there's plenty of complaints, right? Um, and this can be really annoying because, you know, sometimes you're just like, fine, I get it. You don't like it. What do you want me to do about it? This person, though, is doing you a valuable service. And try not to shoot the messenger, even though you may want to, when you have this individual complainer on your team, right? Because that person is helping you get a pulse for what may or may not be going well on your team. But just complaining is not enough. It's not good enough. It's not the thing that actually makes your whole team better, right? Complaining and then bringing the solution and carrying the solution through is what makes the team better, right? The build is too slow. I've got some ideas of how to improve the test speed. I would love to help upgrade the hardware. Hey, can we parallelize this thing? Bringing those solutions through to the team, making suggestions and actually trying to solve the problems that you identify and finding time to solve those problems that you identify is an important part of creating sort of a happy, healthy and valuable culture for everyone around you. One thing you might notice from all of these topics, right, is that really, if you want to be a multiplier, it's not about you personally very much. It's about what you do for everyone around you, everyone on your team, right? Do you make the work environment better for everyone so they're all a little more productive, so that they're all not working on stuff that isn't important, so that they all know how to do the important things that you know how to do? These are the elements of being a multiplier. It's not about you personally getting better. It's about you turning into a person who makes everyone around you better. So there are other things that you may need to become a multiplier. I'm not going to claim that this is an exhaustive list. But I believe that everybody in this room probably possesses those three virtues. And if you just identify them, think about them in your day-to-day -day work, try to lean on them a little bit. I believe that you can start to make a bigger and bigger impact on the team around you. But the final thing that we might think about is how do we actually measure success here? What does success look like? Unfortunately for all of us, there is no web page test or graphite or new relic or performance monitoring in general for you know, your multiplier skills. Right? There's nothing that says, oh, here's my tech skills, and this is not what's holding me back. It's all this people skills stuff that's you know, manipulating the DOM, and oh gosh, no. Terrible, right? Unfortunately, no. There, there is nothing that can do this exactly. So all I can do is give you a few high-level suggestions, the first being something to do with vocabulary. So I worked for Goldman Sachs for a long time. I'm sorry. Um, it was, uh, actually, it was a very good experience for me. I'm, I'm grateful for it. And one of the things that I took away from that was this phrasing, impact and influence. 
Uh, at Goldman, this was a big part of getting certain promotions, was showing that you had impact and influence, and therefore you deserved to have a title that would give you more impact and influence. What do these words really mean? OK, impact. But for this developer, what wouldn't exist? But for this project, what wouldn't people be able to do? But for this person, what projects wouldn't happen? What growth wouldn't exist? Right? So per unit of work you put in, how much comes out? Impact is, you know, it's a little tricky, right? Because obviously if you are a manager who can tell people what to do, theoretically you can have more impact. That brings us to the point of influence. A lot of people think that the way to get influence is to have a title that forces people to listen to you. And I'm not going to claim that titles aren't important, that titles don't provide some level of value, right? Uh, titles do. It, it matters. It matters that I have the CTO title. It opens certain doors for me. People expect me to be a certain way. But titles are not everything. I'm sure that all of you, well, actually, I hope this is not true, but I would guess that many of you have had the experience of having a manager that you didn't respect, that had not shown themselves to have your best interest or know what they were doing very well, right? And so when that person told you to do something, you may do it to the letter of the law, right? But you probably didn't really internalize it and think about what it really meant and actually try to do that everywhere. So I actually think that I have a lot of influence over my organization. My team likes me. I believe I'm pretty respected. But even I have the problem of I can tell people these are the best practices of engineering. Hey, please, you guys need to write tests. Tests are important. Tests are a valuable thing to write. And they will listen to me maybe 50 to 75% of the time. You're never going to get perfect compliance because people are busy. They've got a lot on their plates. But if they at least value your input, there's a chance that they will listen to you on those things that are, you know, you can try to make them mandatory, but you don't have the time. I don't have the time to look at every single pull request and make sure that every single pull request meets my exact standards of code quality and testing and this, that, and the other. And we can automate it a little bit, but there's so many things like that. I cannot possibly look over everyone's shoulder and make sure they're following me correctly. So I have to have a level of influence and authority that has come from showing the team that I know what I'm doing, that when I direct them to do something, the output of that is good for them, is, makes them happier, makes the business better, makes them you know, grow as engineers, right? Influence does not require management, and management does not imply you have a lot of influence, right? Influence is a little bit more like something that you, you get by having a lot of wisdom, right? We've probably also known engineers who didn't necessarily have a lot of direct reports, but who everybody came to for advice. If something was wrong, if something was broken, this was the person you would go to for advice to rubber ducky debug with, right? That's a person with a lot of influence. You don't have to have management authority to have influence. But influence is really important. And if you are a multiplier, you will have influence. People will want to come to you. People will want to listen to what you say and follow you, even if you're not managing them or telling them exactly what to do. So impact and influence. As your impact increases, as your influence increases, probably the result of that is, that is the result of both creating multiplicative effects, and once these increase, you multiply things even more. Your voice carries even farther. OK, well, that's, that's all well and good. Vocabulary is really nice. But what do we actually do to measure this? OK, let's talk about feedback really quick, qualitative feedback, because I cannot promise you quantitative feedback on, again, your skills here. So hopefully most of you have some kind of performance review process. I realize that performance reviews are a little bit controversial for some people. They don't like them. They feel like they, they're problematic in many ways, reasonably. Uh, what I will say is this. Really what we're talking about when we're talking about becoming a multiplier is we're talking about leadership. And leadership requires active engagement with others. And that means that you have to care about what other people think of you. You simply cannot lead successfully. It's, I couldn't say you cannot. It is very hard to lead successfully if you do not care about what other people think of you. If you do not ask them what they think of you, if you don't, do not ask them the simple questions of 
What do you like that I do? What would you like me to do more of? And what would you like me to do less of or stop doing entirely? What are the things that I do that make you less effective? Asking those questions, you've got, to, you've got to ask them. You've got to ask them to a variety of people, right? Not just to the people that love you, not just to the people who work for you, to the people who work with you across the company, right? All the people who interact with you, for whom you would like to have an impact on, those are the people to ask for feedback from. Um, oh, sorry. You will quite possibly, if you do this, uh, discover that people in your organization may hold biases against you. They may be sort of the unconscious biases uh, based on you know, your race or gender or you know, ethnicity or sexual orientation or whatever, which are awful, but they definitely exist. Or they may just be, for whatever reason, when you started at this company, people pinned you into a corner as this kind of person. And even though you're trying not to be that person anymore, they still see you that way. The answer of what to do when you have feedback that shows biases against you, unfortunately, sometimes the answer there is to just find another place to work. And this is like a weird and side note controversial thing that I'm saying here, partly because you know this talk was originally a 20 minute talk, so I figured I'd ramble a little more uh, as part of it. But I, you know, I I feel very weird saying this. As a CTO, if I see biases in reviews, particularly of people for other people on my team, I try to actually address that and train my team and say, like, do you know that like the way that you phrase this? Really, I actually think you are being kind of biased there and you don't realize it, but you know, you just think that because that's a woman and she's speaking up a lot, that that's a bad thing. When in fact, like you this guy over here is the same thing and you gave him a glowing review. So, you know, FYI, you've got a little bias going on there. But if you are just in an organization where for whatever reason you're just getting these biased reviews and you are not in a position where you can really change it, you can choose to stay and try to you know, conform to the culture that you're in, or you can choose to leave. But at the end of the day, the only thing you can really change is yourself. Until you get to a position of very much senior leadership, you can talk about things, you can make changes, but realistically, 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 you've gotta decide whether you yourself wanna put up with an organization that has painted you in a certain way. And this applies to all of you, you know, men in the audience as well, right? Sometimes the organization just says, oh, that guy is a total nerd, doesn't wanna to talk to anyone, you know, all he wants to do is write code. And you're like, I, I wanna lead, I wanna manage, I wanna, I wanna have a bigger team. And the organization just can't see that in you it may be time for you to just find another organization that will see that from you. So, you know, this kind of feedback can be painful, it can be biased, but it is necessary because the only way to lead is to understand the way other people react to you. All right, so to sum this up, I will give you a quote from the poet Rumi, which is, to yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today I am wise, so I am changing myself. It's easy to do what you know how to do and do it more and learn new technical skills and try to just be a little bit more productive. But growth is uncomfortable, growth is hard, and growth requires getting out of your comfort zone. Cloning yourself fundamentally is an additive act and it's impossible, and even if you could create a clone army, that's really not, that's not the goal here, right? The goal is to stop working just on what you know, uh, and stop focusing only on technical skills or getting more done, and instead rely on your virtues of proactive laziness, thoughtful impatience, and team-oriented hubris to get out of your comfort zone, grow, and become a multiplier. And that is it. Thank you very much.